You're listening to Let's Talk Sustainable Business. Hello, my name is Uwe Schulte and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our first podcast in our new series, Let's Talk Sustainable Business. It's brought to you by the Conference Board Global Sustainability Center. Today, I will be talking to John Elkington from Volans about the journey of corporate sustainability uh, all the time from the 70s of the last century until now. But before we get started, we are recording this podcast in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. Please let us express our deep felt sympathy for all those suffering in this crisis and also our recognition of the enormous energy and sacrifice so many around the world are demonstrating in support of those in need. Let me now introduce our guest to you, John Elkington. John is an author, advisor and serial entrepreneur. He is a world authority on corporate sustainability and sustainable development. He has written and co-authored 20 books, including Green Consumer Guide, Cannibals with Forks, The Triple Bottom Line of the 21st Century Business, The Breakthrough Challenge, 10 Ways to Connect Tomorrow's Profits with Tomorrow's Bottom Line, and now has just come out Green Swans. John is founder and chief pollinator at Volans. He's the co-founder and honorary chairman of sustainability. He's a member of the World Wildlife Fund Council of Ambassadors and a visiting professor at Cranfield University School of Management, Imperial College and UCL in London. He's a member of over 20 boards and advisory boards. And over the time, he has been a total in more than 20 uh, in more than 70 boards. So a very warm welcome to you, John. Thank you, Uber. And I just like to uh, add my um, best wishes to everyone who's struggling with COVID-19 uh, around the world. And also to thank you and the conference board for offering me the platform today. This is an absolute pleasure to us and uh, we're looking forward to the conversation. And let's get started to talk about sustainability in general first. Uh, the word has been used in, in various ways and uh, I like the definition from the 1987 UN Brundtland report most, where it says uh, it's development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. How do you see it, John? I think the Brundtland Commission uh, definition was very clear and has stood the test of time. I do think that the intergenerational uh, part of the change agenda is often overlooked. And yet the coronavirus crisis uh, has brought them back full square into the spotlight in the sense that we're trying to protect older people in the population, myself included, and the people who are probably going to suffer most from this are younger uh, people. So those those tensions between the interests of younger and older people, and actually people not even yet born, I, I, th I think is absolutely central to the sustainability agenda, at least as I understand it. Yeah, I, I think you're, uh, you're pointing out a, an important point. But before we get in, into that, um, let's mentally step way back in the 70s. Uh, and um, at that time, corporations didn't have a clear concept of sustainability. Um, during my years at university, uh, the chemical disaster in Seveso, Italy happened. I think it was 1976. Uh, the environmental impact of chemicals became much more prominent and problematic in the eyes of the public. And eight years later, the even bigger tragedy in Bhopal occurred with Union Carbide uh, today the a Dow plant. Um, the 70s and 80s were the time when corporations started, I think, t to take environmental protection much more seriously. Um, but when you, when you consider Rachel Carson, Carson, she published Silent Spring, I think, uh, um, in, in the late 50s or early 60s, I, I can't remember now. Um, and that, I think, was the start of the environmental movement. And it still took such a long time to catch on. Do you see it the same way? I do. And I think uh, Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring came out in 1962 from uh, memory. And as you say, that really was 
a seed crystal around which the global environmental movement uh, builds. And it's interesting that this year, 2020, uh, will mark on April the 22nd, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So that started in the United States in, in, in 1970. Something over 20 million Americans got involved at that stage. So that was about 10% of the population, US population at that stage. And that launched a whole series of uh, new regulations, rules, and so on. Um, and we sort of forget uh, that period in environmental history. But for me, it was really, really um, uh, important. So I, Rachel, Rachel Carson's book, I think, was um, uh, really a catalyst for much of that. But over time, I think the environmental movement has been a bit like a snowball. It's pulled up one issue after another and, and, and sort of uh, incorporated it. And, and that complexity sometimes uh, can be a little bit of a problem. But I think the 50th anniversary is a very good chance not only to look uh, back, but to look forward. Now, that, that's what is, of course, required. But we, we, we're trying to... Um, I, I, I would like to get a sense uh, how this corporate sustainability has developed because I think this is important um, because I think we st we're, we're standing at a brink of um, a new stage and uh, it's always always yeah. good to look back in, in, in history. Um, I, for me, it, it was sort of, uh, I'm sometimes an impatient guy and, uh, you know, when we're talking about the 60s and 70s, uh, uh, John, you and I might uh, be sounding to our audience as, as very old men, which we probably are. But uh, on the other hand, um, we've we've seen it coming along, and I think we should talk about it. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll share something. When I was uh, a product developer in Unilever in Germany, uh, even in the 90s, I was scolded by a senior executive uh, from the Unilever board for collaborating with NGOs uh, for doing a joint evaluation of critical recipe components. What a long way Unilever has come since then, hasn't it? Well, it has. And, and in a way, I think if, you know, firstly to the old men, old people point, uh, I was 70 last year in June. And I actually feel at a time when some of my sort of baby boomer colleagues and friends are getting to the point of retirement, I actually feel that the the challenge that we face is we're only just beginning to understand it. And I think the next 10 to 15 years uh, are potentially the most exciting and challenging and in some ways politically dangerous uh, period of my entire uh, working life. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually quite energized and I'm, I'm feeling that um, now it's all to uh, fight for. But to go back to the story that you were um, uh, underscoring there, I think in a way to start with, it, it looked at um, major projects. So, you know, in the early 1970s, uh, I would work on environmental impact assessments, oil refineries, airports, uh, these sort of motorways and so on, those sorts of things. And then it moved uh, from those projects, those major projects, to uh, production facilities and pro products, exactly what you were dealing with uh, with uh, Unilever. So we got into life cycle assessment and all sorts of complexities uh, around that. And you mentioned kindly the Green Consumer Guide. That came out in 1988. It sold a million copies in uh, just over 18 months. And it just, it happened to coincide with a period where people were very concerned about, agitated about uh, a range of issues relating back to products. And that would be CFCs, it would be lead, it would be mercury, it would be chlorine, all of these different things. And then something happened. And you mentioned NGOs. And I remember Greenpeace more or less at that time, saying to me that they just discovered the power of brands, the leverage that they could have if they attacked uh, brands. Um, and they descri described it as a bit like discovering gunpowder. Uh, and so we suddenly went from major projects and products and processes right into the heart of uh, corporate capitalism around brands and reputation. I think that was a major shift, and that that really drove everything from the early nineties on. Yeah, I I was on the other side. Uh, I remember it well, and uh, um, I I think it when you were in in in, in corporate development, um, you you, ha you saw both sides uh, in a way, 
you, you had to look after, of course, the interests of the uh, of your your company. But at the same time, these guys came up with questions that were really really relevant, and uh, we were struggling for quite a while. What was the right way of engaging uh, with NGOs at that time? And um, I, I, I guess that that gradually changed. And you know, those people who scolded me in the beginning uh, for for having collaborated with NGOs. Uh, were th then really getting the gist of it. And you're right, the brands were an easy lever be because, um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I guess that's why the fast-moving consumer goods were um, one of the first ones to go beyond that uh, completely reactive way of dealing with things. Well, it's funny. I, I, in um, the 80s, I uh, worked with the chairman of um, Unilever in Switzerland and Italy. And this was before the Green Consumer Guide came out. And uh, he, he already, like you, uh, saw the need to engage uh, NGOs in the wider world. And at that time, the board of Unilever, just taking that case, couldn't see it. Uh, and in the end, we ended up um, working with uh, people like Procter & Gamble. But uh, I think that very quickly shifted over time, and I think one of the one of the really critical drivers was the emergence into positions of influence and increasingly power in business of a younger generation, people who no longer saw this as somebody else's agenda, something imposed on them, something that got in the way of the sort of business that they wanted to do, by by a, a, a generation of people who increasingly thought, well, why wouldn't we do this? Just then, the question is, how do we do it to the best? Uh, effect and make commercial sense of it. Yeah, and uh, I, I think we went th in in the late nineties and uh, in the turn of the century went th through a transition where suddenly words like um, corporate social responsibility emerged. Um, I don't think that a lot of people were really very clear what it meant, um, uh, uh, and a lot of incarnations happened. And um, I, I remember that I, I had uh, very interesting debates about what is more important, um, you know, uh, should we look after um, uh, some uh, externalities or should we um, take care of our shareholder and create value for them and everything else will come fall in line? Well, I think in different parts of the world, the, um, the language was rooted in different ways. So, for example, in the United States, corporate citizenship meant volunteering, and there's a long history of um, companies engaging with local communities and philanthropy and so on. If you went to Japan, and I worked for 25 years uh, in Japan in different ways, um, you would find that Japanese corporations would think about uh, global citizenship, by which they primarily meant environment. They did not mean by any stretch of the imagination, human rights, and some of these uh, edgier uh, concepts. And in Europe, it, it fitted into a different cultural concept context uh, again. And I think in a way what happened was that CSR, Corporate Responsibility and its various definitions and uh, interpretations, tended to become the sort of the stepping stone to sustainable development. But most companies, most industries got stranded there. They, they, they thought about how could they be nicer, how could they be better, how could they perhaps get uh, poorer people um, given access to some of their products and services, but they weren't thinking about system change, at least not then. No, uh, uh, absolutely not. And I, I think it was uh, so the early uh, uh, decade in, in the 21st century wa was one of glossy, uh, wonderful reports uh, with wonderful stories which were rather mm. disconnected with uh, the rest of the business. And and that, of course, then caused uh, uh, a lot of criticism uh, around it, greenwashing and, and what have you. But you were right. I, th I think it opened up um, uh, gradually the, the visibility of social aspects beyond just uh, environmental and product safety aspects, didn't it? Yeah, it did. And, and, and it's easy now to look back and criticize uh, corporate uh, reporting in, in, in its various, again, versions and forms. But if you uh, 
think back to what the world was like when uh, organizations like the Vopa Reporting Initiative, where I was part of the founding group and then on the board for a while, uh, when they started to evolve, companies really didn't want to talk about this sort of stuff. They, they didn't know how. Um, and the reporting process enabled them to begin to identify their priorities, begin to engage uh, the wider world, including activists and campaigning uh, NGOs. So I think looking back, it was a very, very important part of the opening up process, but it got stalled. It got stalled because people over time, when it first started, companies, I remember Shell, for example, telling me at one point in the 1980s, they would never report. And the reason they would never report, this particular senior executive told me, was because they were too big and they were too complicated. Well, I actually worked on the first sustainability report that that company did in 1997, which introduced the sort of con the um, concept of the triple bottom line to, and people plan it profit to the wider uh, world. So things changed. And I, I think we forget how much they did change at that point. Now, it's You are right. It's easy to criticize in hindsight and things, you know, we achieved a lot of things in, in these periods as well, you, you know. Uh, think mm. about the um, uh, ozone layer, uh, 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 which really improved through these processes. Lead disappeared uh, uh, from from gasoline. So yes, things have improved, uh, and um, people started to to have a wider range of visibility. And and I think that's that's when the when the word sustainability came in, into it more and. You know, the Millennium Goals that have been uh, criticized uh, a lot uh, for not having achieved exactly what they were aiming for. But these ambitious goals have also um, managed to get um, a, a lot more things going. Even so, I think um, with the Millennium Goals, differently to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, the part the corporations can play and should play wasn't as clear as it is now, don't you think? Well, I think uh, business was still seen to be, if not the enemy, certainly uh, a complicating factor. And therefore, with the Millennium Development Goals, it was largely public sector and government. Um, as you say, with the Sustainable Development Goals, it's been very, very different in the sense that business um, uh, people were in, in, involved from the very outset. So I think it, I think it's um, it's a very important uh, change that we're seeing in the world. I just, I, I want to give you one tiny little reflection, which is that we tend to think a lot of, a lot of these big changes as sort of not terribly strongly linked. But last year I went to the 100th um, birthday party of someone called James Lovelock, oh, yeah. who you will <laughs> remember. But what people don't remember is that Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, was based on work uh, that uh, Lovelock did and then the Shell uh, scientists that Sittingbourne uh, did around persistent insecticides. Then his work on CFCs again disrupted the um, global chemical industry. And then he came up with the idea of Gaia. And that was a very early effort and a scientifically based effort to address the system change issue. So in a way, this th there were people talking about these sorts of things in the 1980s, even the 70s. Um, uh, and it's taken the rest of us a little while to sort of catch up uh, with all of this. But now I think we're on a, a very strongly accelerative curve where people are suddenly uh, starting to demand, why didn't you tell us about this before? Why didn't you tell us how to do it? Uh, <laughs> so it's going to be quite a challenging moment, in, I think, in our collective history. No, I, 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 I like your uh, optimism about the next 15 years. Um, uh, just let's talk a little bit about Gaia because I'm I'm not sure whether everybody yeah. is aware of um, Mother Earth in, in in that sense. Well, uh, I, I should declare an interest, which is that our oldest daughter, who's now I think 41 or 42, um, is called Gaia, and that really was because I came across across uh, Jim Lovelock's work in the 1970s. The simple idea behind Gaia was that the the entire planet can be seen as working very much like a single organism. So in the same way that the body has hormones, uh, there are certain chemicals in the atmosphere which have a quite disproportionate uh, impact on 
weather and climatic uh, patterns. They may come from seaweed, they may come from elsewhere. At the time, dismissed almost out of hand by most people uh, in, in mainstream uh, science. Um, over time, people start to use um, different phraseology. They, they talk about global system science or, or, or whatever it might be, rather than Gaia. But the central concept that the world is much, much more linked than we originally imagined is increasingly obvious uh, to many. And scientists now talk about the Anthropocene, a period, the first period in this planet's history where one species, our own, uh, influences almost everything on, 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 on this particular planet. And we haven't yet grown up to the point where we either recognize that or uh, uh, manage the process effectively. Yeah, I, I, I think this is a very, very powerful concept. And uh, despite the fact that it took a very long time to catch on, um, we, we still should uh, relate back to it. And I, I wasn't aware of the 100th birthday uh, celebration. I think that's a great idea. I will look it up. That's uh, that's that's very interesting. Um, and I, I guess what you were saying um, resonates with me as well, because what I've seen is after the financial crisis in uh, 2008, 2009, um, I, I saw a gradual shift, which is now accelerated, I would say, over the last two years. Suddenly, people mm. in the financial community are starting to realize that um, um, this old idea, there is something on one side, which one companies do when they have time to do it, that suddenly uh, the engagement around the sustainability agenda is a relevant factor to evaluate um, the approach and the solidity, agility, and to use a new word, uh, no, it's not a new word, but a, a more popular word, resilience of a company. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think uh, in, in, in many ways, the way that we've increasingly been thinking about it is much of the so-called sustainability agenda for business has been defined by business and often with very uh, clear self-interest involved as a responsibility agenda. How do you uh, become a bit more transparent? How do you report? How can you be a bit more accountable? How can you get uh, stakeholders engaged? I mean, this is the responsibility stakeholder uh, model, which which uh, people like the Business Roundtable are now sort of coming round to talking about again. But exactly as you uh, described, Uwe, I think what we're in a moment in, in, in history where that responsibility paradigm or framing is no longer remotely enough. It's a good foundational uh, part of this uh, journey. But uh, as some of the big challenges that we've been talking about for a very long time, most obviously the climate emergency, really start to get their claws into supply chains, get their claws into um, urban economies and, and, and so on. The whole issue of resilience, which I first heard uh, in the modern um, uh, under, uh, um, definition, uh, probably about 12 to 15 years on the front lawn of the World Economic Forum in, in, uh, outside uh, Geneva, that's really, really coming up the curve very, very strikingly now. But the only way to ensure longer term resilience of complex systems is to regenerate those systems. And at the moment, what we've been doing uh, very actively without thinking about it is degenerating our economies, degenerating our societies, degenerating most critically the biosphere. Business hasn't yet gone up that learning curve, but by God, I think it's going to do that in the next few years. Yeah. I, I would love to con continue that conversation. It, it, it's really, really great, but we're, we're, we're coming closer to uh, our uh, end of this podcast. But before we do that, uh, let's just go back to the situation we're currently in. And there are people uh, who look at the COVID-19 crisis and they are wondering how this will affect the corporate sustainability agenda. Um, and... Um, uh, we will discuss that uh, in, in the next podcast, um, uh, but maybe um, you can already share a, a, a first thought, um, what you think um, is pessimism the right way of looking at this? Uh, will we be just wanting to reboot uh, uh, economies or are we going to reconsider and, um, and re rethink? Mm. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not a biblical person, but I, you know, bits of the Bible stick in my mind. And the writing on the wall was one of those moments where powerful people were suddenly warned about the nature of the world that they were moving into. And I think COVID-19 and, and its impact uh, around the world is one of those moments where it is becoming very much clearer, even to ordinary people, that the way that we've been doing business, the way we've been understanding growth and GDP, these sorts of things really are not um, fit for purpose in, in, in the rest of this uh, century. So I think things are going to get a good deal uh, blacker or bleaker. Uh, I think the economic and then social repercussions of what's just happened and is continuing to happen are going to play through for not just years, they're going to play th uh, through for decades. And the impact on younger people, I think, is something that we're going to have to think about very much more seriously. But I am an optimist. I do think that when our species gets backed into a corner or backs itself into a corner, as it's now doing, uh, some of our best work uh, can uh, be done. So I expect uh, a, a period of intense innovation at every level in our uh, economies and societies. And I'm very excited to think that you and I and others uh, may well be part of all of that. Uh, the test will be whether we've got something useful to contribute. <laughs> that that indeed will be the test. And uh... Um, we will dive into these questions a little bit more in, in our next podcast in this series where we will welcome John back and, and dive, uh, dive a lot deeper uh, in, into his intriguing uh, new perspectives on what is uh, necessary at the stage of uh, sustainable development as he has outlined in his new book, uh, Green Swans. You want to say just a couple of words of the the book and what motivated to write it um, before we engage in um, the next podcast in uh, in a few days. Happily, I mean, uh, some people will know that I recall the triple bottom line, a concept that I came up with 25 years ago in uh, 2018, and the reason I did it not was not that I thought triple bottom line was a bad idea, but just that it was being misinterpreted and misused. And it wasn't seen to be part of uh, system change. Now, with COVID-19, people are talking about system change uh, left, right, and center. And the new book is basically making the argument that there are moments where things go completely wobbly on us. Uh, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb talked about uh, black swans. We're at one of those moments where black swans are crowding in, w w whether or not we predicted them or, or, or not. But um, the question in my mind is, and now what can we do to ensure that green swans, which are uh, positive exponentials, can be triggered and not just have to cope with managing the risks and managing the impact of negative exponentials, i.e. black swans? Excellent. We'll, we'll, we will explore this uh, a lot more, and um, I'm looking forward to that. And for our audience, if you have enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to our podcast series or explore the entire catalogue of podcast programming from the Conference Board by visiting our website at tcb.org slash podcasts. Thank you for listening, and thank you, John, for joining us today. Thanks, Vivian. That was Let's Talk Sustainable Business. 